Hi, this is Dave Hole, and you're listening to Retrospectives with John Broughton on KC Radio 97.7 FM. Just to kick off, do you you have a a distinct recollection of your initial introduction to the blues? Oh, yeah, I do, yeah. Um, I mean, I... When I say the blues, I, I got into it slowly in one sense because I, I listened to the the Rolling Stones and some of the, so excuse me, some of the English bands that were in my in my uh, young teen years. Um, like you had the Animals and them, and uh, the Stones and bands like that. So I, I was experiencing blues, but not really knowing too much about it. Um, and I had a I had a friend at high school, uh, and we were both guitarists, budding guitarists, and we were sort of playing some of this stuff. And um, we he noticed, we both noticed actually that uh, on the Rolling Stones thing they had um, they had like songs written by people like you know Jimmy Reed and and uh, Muddy Waters all that. Of course, it was Morgan Field and <laughs> and. Uh, they had Chester Burnett, which was Howling Wolf and that sort of stuff. So, but we gradually realised, we came to realise that these were the originators of the music. But we didn't, we didn't really hear them. We, you couldn't get those records in Perth at the time of the of the great blues men. So, but one, we had to order them. And my friend ordered a Muddy Waters record, and it, he came around one Saturday, and that's my distinct memory of hearing the deep blues for the first time. And he put put it on. Put the put the record on the turntable, and it was like I was just <laughs> awestruck. Yeah, you know, to- totally awestruck. It was chalk and cheese. I mean, I still think the the Stones were great and all that, but it was a a much watered down version of what you know. Muddy was just like the power of his performances was something else, and um, spine spine chilling. You know, I just I was literally blown away, and um, I absolutely couldn't get enough of it. So. That was my. It was a very, you know, cathartic moment, or whatever, you know, like a revelation. Yeah. And it, it set me on my course because that, that I thought, this is what I want to do. This is this is the real, you know, this is seriously communicating to me. <laughs> so life, so, uh, life changing was, moment. Yeah. 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 So from that point, did you re- immediately set yourself on a course to, to want to trace the history of the music, and and did you come like an, an instant student of the blues? I guess you could call. Well, yeah, without thinking of it in a studious sense, we just wanted more of this stuff, and we so we thought, well, okay, you know, like, who are these other people, you know, and we eventually stumbled on, you know, Robert Johnson's and those greats like that, so one by one, uh, discovering these great guys like Lightning Hopkins and just, well, all of them, you know, one by one, and, um, and getting their vinyl and just playing it to death and... Uh, it was it, you. You tend to be a musicologist in the end because you, <laughs> you've just gone through the whole process of finding all these these great blues players, and um, so yeah, it's been it's been a lifelong journey. I mean, I still I still find some things that you know that that turn up that I wasn't aware of of the old guys, and of course there's always new music to simulate as well. But um, it's been great. <laughs> You mentioned you were already a budding guitarist at that point. Do you remember your first guitar? Yeah, I had. A, I had. A, when I was at age eleven. My, I was at that time. I was uh, into whatever was on the radio, which was. But it was always guitar twangy music, like Buddy Holly or something like that. You know, Everly Brothers always had guitars in it. That you know, when I was a little kid, and my, I wanted a guitar, and my parents hung out for ages but they eventually got one for me when I was 11 it was an acoustic but it was almost unplayable I mean I managed to get you know play notes on it and play a little bit with it but it was when I look back I think you know it was a, it was a little bit cruel because it was so bad the guitar that the reaction on it was like you know <laughs> half an inch off the fretboard you know what I mean yeah um so it was hard, it was tough going but Anyway, I persevered enough for them to realise that I really was into it. And they bought me then a nylon string classical which guitar, which they thought, well, he liked guitar, so we'll have him budding Zagovia here, you know. <laughs> and um, so I did a little bit of classical music, but it wasn't where my heart was, you know. I mean, as much as I think it's great and all that, but uh, it, uh, it ended up being put under the bed, that guitar, after, um, you know, about a, a year of 
playing, you know, I had some lessons, a few basic lessons on classical music and stuff. Uh, put it under the bed and then it was in Thailand. I met this friend I was talking about, Daryl Upson, his name is, was and is. Um, and he he had this song, I was walking up and down the aisle in the school room and the classroom and he had this Book of the Shadows songs open on his desk. You know? mm-hmm. <laughs> well, he should have had maths or something, but... Um, and and I said, oh, you, you like that stuff? Because I like the shadows and, and that. And he said, yeah, I play a bit of guitar. And he said, so I, oh, I do too, you know, which I didn't really because I'd given it up for a few years. But um, anyway, we, we had a mutual interest and got together and him and his brother both played a bit of guitar and, um, and we started just hanging out and he taught me chords, which I didn't know. He was way advanced to me at that point. And... Um, we ended up forming a high school band, as was pretty common in those days. You know, mm. everyone everyone wanted to be the Beatles or the Stones or <laughs> whatever, and um, and that that got me on, set me on the course. You know, and from that we initially we were playing Beatles and and Shadows songs and that, but we soon gravitated to the blues, as I as I mentioned. How um, how lively a scene was it over there in, in Perth in those early days with those early bands? Well, there was a scene. I mean, and it was it was uh, there was some quite good uh, there was some actually good musicians here. Um, and we, as schoolboys, we used to catch the bus from where we lived in the suburbs into Perth and uh, watch, you know, on the Friday Saturday night, watch some of these other bands. And um, there was a couple of couple of good ones. Um, actually, Johnny Young had a band, Johnny Young and the Strangers, and. Um, this was in his initial phase when he was just a kid himself, <laughs> and he, um, he, he, his band was pretty good, although they didn't do much blues, but they were very good. And then there was another band called Russ Kennedy, Russ and the Little Wheels. They were excellent too, but they were pretty full-on blues. They used to do, um, you know, they'd do John Lee Hooker songs and stuff like that. So we used to. <laughs> Him. And there was another couple of bands around that were doing bluesy stuff, and uh, and it was the era of the Stomps at the beach oh, yeah. and whatever, you know, mm. <laughs> the, at the surf club houses and that, you know, on a Friday night there'd be the Stomp, and uh, so we we were a bit underage at that point. <clears throat> we used to sneak around and try and get into these places and stuff. So there was some example to follow, you know, but no no great sort of, um, you know, I mean we didn't. We didn't have the luxury of like American kids did of maybe seeing BB King at their local or whatever. There's <laughs> no that, that was a long time before I saw live um, some of those greats. Yeah. So, what point was the, the the moment when you had that accident with your finger that um, led to your your playing style? Well, that's quite a way. Well, it's not that long, I suppose. I I think I've been playing I've been playing sort of in a band for about. Um, six years when that happened um, and I was playing uh, standard tuned guitar sort of thing not not slide but um, and I broke that finger just kicking end to end with a with a mate footy and I went up to the specky mark and came <laughs> down with a broken finger there, you know? <laughs> uh, so yeah that was in a ca- I had to put that finger in a cast for well it was the best part of three months and I couldn't play ordinary guitar but I had just started dabbling in slide as most guitarists do at some point you know, mm-hmm. that, so I mean I was a huge fan of Elmore James but I had no idea how he got that sound uh, but well, I knew it was a slide but, uh, so I'd muck and I was, had a slide at home and I managed to jam it on the index finger and hang it over the top of the neck and get a bit of a, a, a feel for slide guitar that way you know with the full intention that once that uh, so my fingers healed, I put it back on, you know, put the slide up back on the little finger where most players, or the, you know, the ring finger or the little finger. So, um, but I, I had done that sort of three month period mucking around. I got sort of to feel comfortable doing it in that oddball way, and it just stuck. When I tried to revert to the more conventional slide uh, style of 
it didn't work for me, so I reversed it back. And so, you know, that was it, really. And I, yeah. did, and I, and I only had a couple of songs that I could play on the slide when I started doing it. And uh, but it was interesting that when I when I played at the the local pub and that, uh, those were the two songs that people kept coming up and saying, "Hey, you do that one again with that thing on your finger there." <laughs> <laughs> so. I gravitated more and more over over a few years to incorporating more and more slide in uh, in my repertoire. You know. So, so how much different do you think your music would have become had you reverted back to the conventional way of playing? Well, it's hard to say, really, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, uh, it may. I may still have loved playing slide, and it, you know. And I mean, there's no there's no reason why uh, you have to play the way I play. I mean, it, it does have ha- a slightly different. Um, a slightly different tonality or some, something's a little bit different about it um, mm. uh, and I know that from when I first sent um, my, my first album that I made uh, my first recordings I sent them overseas and and the editor of Guitar Player Ragazine rang me up in the middle of the night and said he knew he knew something was different he said what are you so what are you <laughs> he said I don't know he plays fine but there's something strange something different you know and I told him he said that's what it is you know? <laughs> Yeah. So you'd obviously paid your dues by the time of your first album coming around. In hindsight, do you, do you think that was a good thing that it had you better prepared for for what was to follow, career wise? Um, I think in some way it has it has its benefits, but um, I think I was playing. Uh, if you're talking about my guitar playing, I think I was playing much similar sort of standard when I was about 24. And that break didn't come till I was 40. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, I was, I was probably 16 years when I I could have been, you know, do, do it, making all stuff. But, um, but then again, having it come later in life, or, you know, middle age, as it were, pretty much, um, it had the benefit, I think, of me being fairly grounded, you know, like yeah. when I first went over to America and started touring Europe and all that stuff. I was no young sort of guy getting all carried away and partying every night after the gigs, and you know I had I was a little more sensible by that time. So I think possibly it had certainly had its advantage not to be discovered at a young age because I think it can be detrimental if you get too carried away. Yeah, probably a greater sense of appreciation for for what you've achieved. Yeah, yeah. and I did I did definitely appreciate it. That's right. It, it, you know it was. Uh, Obviously, something I had totally out of the blue. I hadn't expected at that point in my life to become better known, or you know, to be able to have the possibility of you know having records out over overseas and touring overseas and all that. You know, that, that came as a a real bonus and something that was totally unexpected. So I did appreciate it for sure. We talked about life-changing moments early, and I guess sending that copy of Short Fuse Blues to Guitar Player magazine was uh, certainly a life-changing moment for you. Have you ever pondered how your career may have turned out had you not done that? Well, I, I think possibly, well, I'm pretty sure nothing would have much happened with that first album, you know. Um, no no uh, Australian record company was interested. Um, they, they just weren't into blues, and uh, but... It was a paradoxical thing because eventually I signed festival records, now defunct of course, but um, I signed with festival records and they, they got interested purely on the back of that I was being successful over in America. Mm. So, but they would they were not interested in the first instance. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you know, um, yeah, no, it would, I don't think much would have happened. It was a that was. You know, they always say that in this business it's great to have a bit of talent or whatever, but you do need luck. And I, from my experience, I would have to endorse that. I, I had my lucky break. It was um, just luck that I, you know, I had no, I had no great ambitions for that album. I made it really to sell as a cassette to um, to, to fans at local gigs because they'd they'd started bringing along tape, you know, recorders and stuff, and making copies of, you know, recording my performances and that and I, I thought well they're gonna, I might as well make a slightly better one and mm. I had a mate who was an engineer in a studio and he gave me you know, they worked out a real good deal I did the whole thing in three days that first album and um, I had no aspirations really other than that 
Um, and I, the only thing I did was, as an avid reader of Guitar Player magazine, I sent a copy to them, and it's the one and only thing I did, you know, as far as, like, trying to... Um, well, it wasn't even that much of an effort to try and, and uh, you know, get, get things rolling. It was really just a whim, and <clears throat> what they had in particular in th at that time in that magazine, they had a section in the back, and it was it was just a little column where they sort of highlight f featured uh, local, mostly, well, they were all American, but they were sort of people, you know, might be in someone in, uh, you know, Arizona, somewhere or, you know, somewhere or, you know, some little town, and he plays at his local bar and he likes playing jazz and that. So, so it's a neat little profile thing mm. of of play, and it was, I think it was just a kind of a nod to the readers that, you know, if you send stuff in, we might, you might get in here and we'll just say, you know, it's a little bit of, a little bit of a help to, to them. It wasn't a great big thing, but in a really tiny little section, I thought well, they might, you know, pick, that was my aim. I thought if they pick that up, they might put me in there and say, oh, there's a guy from Australia and he plays, you know, this sort of, music. Yeah, just a little thing. So that was my aim. And then, uh, yeah, and, uh, it's like that fortnight after I sent it off, I got this call in the middle of the night from, because uh, I put my details on the letter that I sent, the mm -hmm. accompanying letter, and I got this in the middle of the night and fell out of bed, actually, because I thought, I thought, my first inkling was it was a hoax. Yeah. And I, but I, you know, the, the guy said, oh, yeah, this is Joe Brett from Guitar Player Magazine, and it was an American accent, and I thought, who do I know that does a good American accent that's, you know, taking the piss here? Cause, um, and I, but I hadn't told anyone, so that's when I really, you know, I just quickly realised I hadn't told anyone, so they wouldn't have known. So, yep, and it was him and he, um, he well, the first thing he sent to me, which just blew me away, was he said, I'm going to give this thing the best review I've given anything in years. And um, I, <laughs> that's when I did fall out of bed. And... Uh, yeah, I'm sitting on the floor with the phone, and um, he said, uh, "Yeah, no, we 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 love it." And I played it, played it, and uh, I was in my office. He said, and all the other, uh, all the other Ryzen editors and that will come run down the hall and say, "What's that you got?" And uh, so he said, "We we love it," and um, and he did. He was true to his word. Um, you know, the, the review he gave it was like started with magnificent, staggering, almost beyond belief. And uh, went on from there. <laughs> you know, it was just a, um, it was just that lucky break. Yeah. He hadn't heard, and he did say to me later. He said, "We get we get thousands of things, of course." And he said, "A lot of them we just don't have time to listen." But he said, "But it did intrigue me because it was from Australia." Oh wow! So he opened it and had a quick listen. Yeah. And of course, it led to you being the first uh, non-American artist uh, with uh, signed with Alligator Records. Did the significance yeah. of that really sink in with you at the time? Uh, well, I mean, that happened a little bit later. Um, the jazz, the well, the guitar player guys got on my case. They thought, "Oh, this guy needs to be heard," and all that. So they started soliciting, you know, interest from different record companies. And the first one, basically, that they looked at, which was my favourite record company, because after my own. Um, half my own record collection was on Alligator, you know. So mm. it, it was the dream thing. So they got in touch with Bruce Eglau, the president of Alligator, and he they gave him a copy, got him a copy, and he wrote me a really nice letter saying, you know, I think it's excellent and we really like it and that, but we don't work, we only really work with US artists. It'd be too onerous and, and then, you know, just good luck and blah, blah, blah. And I, I was thrilled with this letter mm -hmm. and uh, showed it to everyone. You're like, yeah, Bruce liked it, you know, and all that sort of thing, even though he didn't offer me a deal. And um, then we were, I was talking, there was another couple of interested parties and, uh, and by this time I also had a lot of interest in Europe and I actually had some things going there a little bit and then I got a call from Bruce saying um, have you uh, signed with with anyone yet and I said no and he said well because we might reconsider if you're interested and what had happened was his staff had worn him down because <laughs> <laughs> they, they did their normal you know as record companies do their weekly meeting and um, you know well who's got what and who's what do you think about who 
you know, looking at new music and stuff like that. And, and there was a couple of staff members that just every time he said, what, 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 what do we got? And they'd say, Dave Hole. And he'd say, no, 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 hang on, we told you, I told you, it'd be too hard to, you know, the guys from Australia, and then the next week, who we got Dave Hole, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I just wore him down. So he eventually took the yeah. Mm. Talk about your, your songwriting process. Is that um, something that's changed much through the years? Is there a set procedure that you always work to, or is it, is it vary from, from song to song? It varies. Um, there's no procedure, and I, I've, I very rarely, very rarely sit down. I can't even really think of ever sitting down to write a song. I just, if some ideas come to me, I mean, I might be just doodling around on the guitar, for example and not with an intention of writing a song, but just um, playing around on the guitar and, and a little riff or some idea will come up, you know, as I'm, as I'm doing it. And I'll go, oh, that's good. And I, it, that will form a nucleus of something. Um, on the other hand, I, I have also had songs just come into my head uh, with the basic melody and the, the basic song, and then I'll sit down and try and nut it out. Um, and so... Basically, it's like for me, and I don't know, can't speak for other songwriters. It's like songs are sort of there, and they're waiting. Sometimes it seems like they're in the air, and they're just waiting for you to put your antenna up, and mm. and and as one's going past, sort of thing. Um, a few songs I've had, I've just woken up in the morning with the whole song, almost the whole song, to totally in my head, rushed to the guitar, and you know, and put it, played it, and and worked it out and and uh, those <clears throat> those are few and far between but they're they're great because they, they're sort of written already and um one of those exactly was on the first album was called the bottle and i woke up with that whole song in my head and um and i so much so weird that i actually thought for a long time that it must be an existing song that i didn't bear you know Mm-hmm. Uh, song song you've heard but you don't you're not consciously aware that that you have and so it's it's come out you know and you'll find out you'll you know you'll record it and you'll go and then you'll find out it's something oh dear someone else is, <laughs> that song and i'll just put different words to another song but it, it turned out it wasn't so yeah it's weird it's weird sometimes the way songs come to you um but most often, that's not normal. Most often, I get the seed of an idea, a riff or something, or some lyrics and the basic thing, and then I um, then comes the you know the 99% of um, the, the sets of sweat, you know, after the 1% inspiration sort of thing. So they can take various times. And sometimes I um, shelve a, a song for ages and you know come back a year later and st- and continue writing it. So. Um, I've got fragments, as I'm sure most songwriters do, on on little tapes and things. I've got basically, well, I suppose it's probably hundreds of little ideas for songs and kernels of songs, and, you know, the gist of, of, of a song. So um, I'm never stuck. Yeah. I, if I need to do an album, I'm never stuck for songs in that sense. I mean, I may not have the finished articles ready to go, but... I can dig back through things and find things that interest me that I, oh yeah, that was quite good and, you know, forge the new material from it. So. Hey, you've come in contact with uh, many greats of the blues uh, through the years. Uh, many would have been heroes of yours. Any any standout highlights there? Oh, yeah, look, every time I've, I've met anyone, you know, the, my idols, I mean, bear in mind that most of them, you know, Elmore James, Muddy Waters, those guys obviously Robert Johnson they were all gone by the time I went over to America and that so never met them of course but um, yeah Buddy Guy has become somewhat of a friend um, and I've jammed with him several times and and played with him and and he's a great great guy and a great player of course and then uh, John Mayle is also a bit of a fan of mine apparently (laughs) well the first time I met him I was playing uh, a festival in the Midwest, and he was the high. He was the uh, the uh, you know the high, top of the bill, and we were like second on the bill, and we so we played our our bit, and then I um I was standing at the side of the stage waiting for John to come on and play, and um, 
I got this tap on my shoulder and I turned around it was John <laughs> Dave he knew, already knew who I was I was, I was flabbergasted and I said oh um, hi John and he said um, yeah he said uh, love your album he said we've been playing it on the tour bus all the, all this tour and that sort of thing so he sort of took away my my sort of he took, stole the thunder straight away and I you know I said well I, I didn't to say I'm a huge fan of yours <laughs> and uh, so you know I've, I've crossed paths with him quite a bit over the years and and, and he's a he's well I think everyone knows that he's a great supporter of of other musicians and guitar players in particular yep he's a lovely guy and um so that, that's been good, knowing John, and also um, I think one of the things that stands out most for me was um, I did a, a show in Chicago, and Otis Rush, came, who Otis Rush was one of my absolute heroes, well, always, but when I was a, a teenager, I, I, I had an al- album of his, and I learned note for note the whole album, and I played it over and over and over, and um, so I was, he was just a, an absolute god to me. And uh, I was playing a show in Chicago, and he turned up and uh, came backstage. I was doing it in two halves, the show, and he came backstage. And um, his guy said, oh, Mr., you know, he's, he's um, Mr. Russ is here, and he got his hello if you not. So he came backstage and introduced himself and all that. And, um, and, then, it, and then, the you know, we were talking and that, and I, I sort of sensed, you know, anyway, I, the, what happened was he... He did have a guitar with him <laughs> out, in, out in the car, and uh, I got him to come and play with me. A couple, I thought it would be a couple of songs, but he had such a good time. He stayed for the whole second half of the show, and we just did. It was great for me because I knew all his songs, and um, we started, we did a couple of things, and he played guitar, and then he put his guitar down, and um, I, I thought, oh, that's it. You know, uh, and so I you know, the mic, you know, how about it for the great, you know, Otis Rush? Let's hear it for Otis Rush, sort of thing. And he came over to me, I thought he was walking off the stage, and he came over to me and he says, I ain't going, I ain't going nowhere. <laughs> I, I, said, I said, what? He said, he said, I'll just sing a couple. You you got that guitar covered, boy. You know? <laughs> so so, so it, was, it was wonderful. And he sang a few more songs, and, and I was such a fan of his that I was able to play um, not as good as Otis would have played it perhaps but I was able to play the, the licks you know what I mean that was like I was it was like a, um, a dream come true a, a fantasy you know you, yeah. you are playing Ot- Otis Russ uh, licks behind Otis Russ you know so we had we had a good time that night and um, and he came back to a, another show about a year later and we did it all again so <laughs> Uh, that was that was a bit of a highlight. Yeah, um, that's a great story. Yeah. Has a long gap between albums, between um, your last album, The Rough Diamond, and, and then going back down, uh, almost about 10 years, I think it was. Did, did you make a yeah. conscious uh, decision to, to take a step back from recording? Yeah, um, I did, but no, I didn't anticipate it would be quite so long. Um, but what I did, um, I decided I would like to record at home and, and get a home studio together and it took me a long time to do that um, to assemble the equipment and that, you know the, what you need but also to learn the skills because I wanted to engineer it myself I wanted the whole freedom of being able to create uh, what I wanted and when I wanted it you know so to do that freedom to get up in the morning and if you felt inspired to do some recording mm-hmm. if you didn't well, you didn't have to you know uh, so of course that's a dangerous thing because you end up taking a long time. But learning the actual uh, learning the actual software stuff and the whole recording process. I mean, I'd sat alongside engineers and whatever making my album, so I had a good idea of Pro Tools, you know, the software and all that stuff. But but to actually learn it and get around it and be able to do it myself took was a big learning curve, and so. I, that took a long time, and um, but uh, you know, I mean, I'd, I'd had previously had occasions when I'd, you know, as you, you book a studio for like a lockout for a couple of weeks or something to record an album, and you might not be feeling like I've actually had an instance where I was had a terrible cold uh, all the way through that fortnight, but you have to do it because the 
looking you've at got the time and, booked, yeah. And you're on a time frame, you know, with the record company with their street date and you know, pressing, uh, mastering, pressing, and all that stuff. So, um, so you know, I had to sort of sing with this voice which wasn't up to scratch, and and I thought I really don't want to have to do that kind of thing. I'd, I'd like to be able to have more control. So, so that was the upshot of that was the reason why it took so long. Um, it was simply that I was, um, I mean, I had stepped back a little bit. I came off the road. Uh, I was a little bit over the constant cycle of of writing, recording, touring, writing, recording, touring. You know, um, mm-hmm. that was a it was a never ending cycle for about fifteen years, and um, and I, I wanted to step back from that a little bit and break that sort of. Um, yeah, just break that cycle and 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 maybe do a few other things in life other than just which I mean I love performing and all that but it, if it, if it's your hundred percent of what you do it's you know you're not you're missing out a little bit on the other things you know um, just the general you know hanging out with friends going to the beach anything else that you might want to do gets pushed pushed away you know just just don't don't have the time to do it so. It was a little bit of that, and then the getting the recordings, um, you know, home recording thing together, and then and then doing it. It took a while to record because um, I I did it fairly slowly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it was fun. I mean, you know, the other thing was I was enjoying the. You know, it wasn't like a oh dear, it's taking a long time. The whole thing was a great a great experience for me, and I enjoyed learning how to do it and, and, and actually making the album. So, um, yeah, so you get to a point, I think, when you've sort of, well, that was album 10. Yeah. You know, having done nine albums, you get to the point where you feel like you have the luxury just you know, to do it in your own uh, way. Yeah, and you've become a lot more tech-savvy in the meantime. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, I mean, I'm no... No great. I'm not, I'm not one of the world's great engineers or anything, but um, I I can find my way around and and do it, and uh, and it's great now because I'm just actually at the point. Now it's been a while since that album came out now, and I'm just starting to get into recording some new stuff now, and uh, we'll see. I'm sure it's going to be a lot quicker because I'm I'm up to speed on the on the technical stuff now. Yeah. So what can you tell us about this new material that you've got uh, in the works? Well, it's a bit more diverse. I think there's a, there's, um, there's a couple of things that I've written that are... Like, I mean, I've always been more of a Chicago blues kind of guy. I mean, Elmore James probably is the most biggest influence on my music. But there's, there's a couple of things that are more southern rocky type of feel for me. Um more like in the vein of maybe the Ormond Brothers or or um, you know one of those one of mm-hmm. those southern rock bands. That, um, uh, there's a couple of those that that have just come out that way in the writing, and um, and I'm enjoying that because it's slightly different. Um, and then there's a few there's a, there's a another few songs I've written are pretty laid back for me, um, and because I've always been. Most of my songs are pretty full on, you know, high energy sort of mm-hmm. thing. But there will be some of that because <laughs> that's that's you know, it's in my DNA. But but there's a couple of um, quite laid back sort of just grooves and with with this guitar not actually over, not overwhelming. Or hopefully not overwhelming everything, but just complementing the the groove and the song. So yeah, a little bit, a little bit different direction as you know time goes by you do tend to change direction just without having to even think about it yeah not not even conscious you just uh, go the way you feel so what what um what time frame are we looking at for for that material to be to be out and about well i haven't set myself a time frame which probably i should um Mm. but i'm anticipating it's probably going to be at least a year before it'll be out um, because by the time I get the recording done and the mastering and you know everything like that, and then you you need a lead time. Um, you know I don't I don't want to with this one I'm not uh, 
trying to sort of set, usually work backwards when record companies are pressuring, you know, it's like we need the album to be out at this date, so therefore you need to have the recording finished by this date, and mm. we can do the, then we can do the, the uh, mastering and the artwork and all the post production by this date and get the press done, pressing done. So it all works backwards to a point where you're always under the hammer, you know, you, you know, we have to get it finished by this. This process, this part of it has to be done by this, and this. so I'm, I haven't done that that way. I want to be able to just do it in a in a in a sort of more relaxed way. So I think it's going to be, a, I'd say, about a year. Yeah, and hopefully it by then be, it may be, it may be quicker. You know, so <laughs> things fall into place. Yeah. Well, hopefully by then the world will be back to some sort of normal, and you'll be able to get out and promote it too. Well. That thing, isn't it? I mean, things are kind of. I mean, it, well, thankfully, I can record at home. Uh, you know, so I, I'm not sort of having to go out and book studios and stuff. Um, yeah. But uh, but uh, you know, it is. It's not a good time to be releasing product if you can't go out and support it. That's right. Live. Mm. Are, are you missing touring? I mean, I, I, you you took a conscious step back from it, but now you've had one yeah. imposed on you. Is <laughs> Yeah. Is it something well, you miss? I am. I am. I think, like most musicians, I'm missing that the live performance. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, because I, you know, I've been sort of like everyone else, pretty much grounded, and um, I have got some. There was a couple of shows next month booked here in Perth. So three shows. Uh, one in in Geraldton, up uh, north of Perth, but um, and yeah, the promoters that have booked me for those seem confident that they're going to go ahead with our situation as it is here. Oh, good. So I'm hoping that, I'm hoping that's the case because I am itching to get out and play. Yeah, and, sure. and give you a chance to road test the new songs too. Yeah, that's right. Dave, thanks so much for your time. It's been great catching up with you. Congrats on a, on a fantastic career so far and um, we're sure there's plenty more to come and um, we'll look forward to seeing you back in Melbourne post-COVID. <laughs> Yes, I'd love to get back, and I'd love to think that Melbourne will be back full steam fairly soon. we just got to hope that that comes to pass, really. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. Great. Uh, yeah, anyway, well, it's been a pleasure too, John. Thanks. Thanks for your time, Dave. Okay, then. All the best. Okay, bye-bye. Cheers.